people now actually are concerned about energy and the environment. Whether that will lead to us doing something about it is another question. It's hard for people to change. Do we live a sustainable lifestyle? Uh, that, that's an easy question. No, we don't live a sustainable lifestyle. I don't think anybody really argues that anymore. People do come together. They do listen to each other when they're given the opportunity. And they do arrive at compromises that make sense for their community. We're in a challenging time. Our economy is really tough. I think the public is really searching. People care about energy, they care about the environment, and they care about their natural resources, and they want to learn. There are citizens out there that can teach us. Green Cities Leading the Way is a co-production of the League of Minnesota Cities on the web at lmc.org and TPT's Minnesota channel. If we're saving money for the taxpayer, that message resonates with every single kind of taxpayer. When we're conserving and we're being more efficient in our use of energy, it serves everyone. And we don't even have to have the debate about global warming. Cities are starting to realize that they can save energy, reduce their carbon emissions, and save money at the same time. We've grown up on cheap energy, and we've got a lot of really bad habits, so there's a lot we can save just by turning things off. Ideas have to come from the community. One of the things that we've discovered over and over when we do community-based planning work if you allow the community to make educated decisions, they almost always make good decisions. Every time the gas spikes, gasoline prices spike, everybody has a sense of urgency all of a sudden. The problem is, is that when people get used to this price or the price goes down, a volatility goes up and down, that they lose a sense of urgency. And over time, we have not had nearly the sense of urgency that we need to. Our society in the 70s went through an oil, oil crisis, an energy crisis, and we've had 35 years to say, you know what, this is going to happen again. Let's take, let's take the slow and relatively painless task of slowly ratcheting up our investments in a way to insulate ourselves from that risk. But instead we didn't. We had no sense of urgency and now we have another crisis and the people are saying, oh, now it's going to cost us all this money. And you know what, it is a lot worse now than it would have been if we'd done it in a slow manner. If we actually had mileage standards for vehicles, if we'd actually increased our building codes we could have done that over time, and it would have been small costs added on top of each other and led us to a place far less risky than we're in right now. Minnesota is actually one of the leaders when it comes to utility conservation. In the Midwest, Minnesota is clearly the leader, but that's just because everybody else has ignored it. One of the things that a lot of people are really interested in is trying to make the entire community energy efficient and help the entire community reduce their carbon emissions. This is not complicated to do. It's not technically difficult to do. The difficult part of it is the people part of it, mobilizing people to do it. If we can mobilize people to take action, we've got all the services we need, primarily from utilities, for the actions they can take. And it's amazing the difference people can make with these low-cost actions. people will stop driving at $6.60 a gallon, which is on its way. Because of the challenges in our energy crisis, it's going to give us a new economy. We know that our, our educational systems, our research and development have geared up for this time. Let's use this. Cities are the forefront of creating an economy that is going to be brighter as a result of uh, conservation of energy and also energy efficiency. From small cities to large cities, from uh, greater Minnesota to the metropolitan area and suburban communities, it is our responsibility as leaders, it's a responsibility as citizens to leave our future better than what we have. Now, we also have to be practical about this. We have to know that it's, it has to be for our now, too. Saving us money is a good thing. 
and our taxpayers like when we save, save them money. I used to go into communities when we did land use planning and I'd say, we'd have an issues identification session and I'd say, well, well what about energy? And I'd get these blank stares. People would say, energy? We're doing a local comprehensive plan. What do we care about? What is energy? And about three or four years ago, I went into a community and I said, okay, what are the issues important to this community? And somebody raises their hand and they said, well, what about energy? We have rising gas prices, and you know what? That's going to affect development, the way the development occurs, and we've got to account for that. I was floored. And then it happened in another community. Uh, government leaders are about as dumb as anybody on the block, and sometimes uh, more stupid. But what we have to do is pay attention to the good people of our community. Then you get the good ideas. Uh, the ideas don't come from the top down. They come from the bottom up. One of the really exciting things about being mayor of a city of Minneapolis is that uh, our citizens start with green values. My job, uh, luckily, hasn't been so much to convince citizens to do something as much as to get them all pulling in the same direction. How unique is Elk River? We don't think there's another community in the, um, probably in the nation, that has a, a diverse array of uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies. How have you seen Barnesville change since you've been living here? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think it's continued to grow. Um, it's known, of course, as a bedroom community, but a lot of residents have moved into the, the Barnesville area. The uh, school system is thriving. Well, Barnesville is located in uh, northwestern Minnesota. We're about 20 miles from Fargo, North Dakota, and 25 miles from Fergus Falls. The population is 2,317 people. Uh, we're primarily ag community, as well as we are a bedroom community for the Fargo-Moorhead, Fergus Falls area. Back in the early 90s, when our economic development group said, we're going to be a, a small community that stays alive, our incentive there was to be cutting edge. It was to be different. It was to stand out from the crowd. And part of that has been accomplished by our efforts to attract young families to the community, a direct tie into green. It's very unique. There's no other city in the United States that has as many enterprises as we do. We have 10 enterprise funds. We own the telephone company, the electric company, the ambulance, the liquor store, uh, as well as a recycling program and our waste sanitation. Mostly out of, out of necessity. Uh, we, we, there's nobody here to offer that, those other services. We offset the general fund operations. So our taxes are very low in comparison to the other parts of the United States, as well as Minnesota. We have a brand new water tower, and brand new sanitation plants here. It maybe isn't always easy to water every other day. It's conserving water. It's making sure that our, our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren have these valuable resources right here in Barnesville. Really state-of-the-art recycling center. Every spring we offer a citywide cleanup week. We really encourage people to recycle, reuse, rather than fill our landfills. We offer programs that encourage people to replace their standard light bulbs with the compact fluorescent light bulbs. Anytime you can help a customer save money, they get excited. We just have to be more prudent in, in not landfilling these. If the city has a high peak or a high demand of electricity, we can control that to ultimately reduce the overall carbon impact. When we talk about the incentive side, it, it really is endless, the number of programs that we offer. We have uh, Energy Star rebates. The way the rebate works is there's any number of Energy Star appliances, and if people purchase those and bring proof of purchase into City Hall, they're then issued a rebate. And that includes such items as dishwashers, we have washing machines. So if somebody has an old uh, furnace, they want to get a newer high efficient water water heater the city will actually subsidize that purchase to ensure that they are going green as well as reducing the overall impact or, or draw on our electricity if you were to take a say a 12 inch tree in a boulevard ask any realtor that tree would be worth two to three thousand dollars in my estimation you know you times that by all the trees in barnesville there's, there's a tremendous value there 
we've had a focus on our park system and making sure that we're replanting trees. Citizens certainly have an input in, in the progressiveness of our, our town concerning everything. There's so much going on here and so many people involved in it that um, it's really wonderful. There's a real sense of community and sure not everybody's going to have the same opinion about things. We've got a lot of young people. We've got an awful lot of young people. The older people, they go with the flow. You know what I mean? They're kind of, it's, it's kind of tough for them. I mean, all of a sudden they've used plastic bags at the grocery stores forever. And all of a sudden you give them this recyclable bag and they're kind of looking at it, what's this for? They could take these to the library, they could take them to the grocery store, they could bring them to the lake. Pretty soon the grocery store over here, he's going to go, man, I don't have to have these plastic bags or these brown paper bags anymore. As more people move in here with expectations that they bring with them from other cities, that more and more is going to happen. Even with the city of Barnesville, the finances gets a little scarce sometimes, but you can do a lot with a little. If you, if you do, if you plan it right. I would like to see wind energy. If Barnesville had one wind generator, wow. When people call my office and, and it's a young family in their late 20s, uh, they're, they're starting to have children. Sure, they're asking me about the school system, but they're asking me about recycling. They're asking about what programs are available to me to be green. If Barnesville can do it, you can do it. I think that's one of the biggest messages there is that if you make a focused effort to try to go green or a uh, focused effort to reduce your overall carbon impact or overall general waste impact, you're going to have a better community as well as be able to prepare your community for the next generation to come. I do believe that cities are thinking this way because they have limited budgets. A lot of cities in Minnesota see the pressing situation because it, it truly ripples through every aspect of what city government does in their services. The thing that I think is exciting is that you hear mayors and city council members, you hear the governor, you hear legislators talking about energy, doing, creating legislation around energy. I remember a couple years ago I was at the legislature and I was arguing with a bunch of utilities about different policies. And I realized they agreed with me and they were opposing what I was recommending. Uh, and then the next year we passed all of this stuff and they all thought it was great. I think we all knew what we needed to do. We just didn't want to change. Elk River is mostly west, but a little bit north of uh, Minneapolis. We're around 23,000 people right now, been growing for the last 15 years at a high pace. I think that the people in this community are, are interested in, in seeing their government uh, provide some opportunities for them to do the right thing by the environment, but also if we're talking about efficiencies and conservation of energy, that means that there will be savings. It got started in 1996. The Minnesota Environmental Initiative was looking for a place in Minnesota or the upper Midwest where they could demonstrate energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies and Elk River was selected from about 32 different communities that applied. I believe we have now about 28 different uh, uh, demonstration sites featuring 18 different technologies. The first project of course came along was the RDF plant, the refuse derived fuel plant. The RDF plant uh, receives about 1500 tons of garbage a day and processes that into 1,200 tons of refuse-derived fuel. Produces enough energy for about 30,000 homes. Second one probably would be the utility-scale wind generator, about five miles north of town. The landfill gas electric generating plant is also another rather unique facility. I think a lot of people hear the word landfill. It uh, pushes a lot of buttons. Well, we have partnered with uh, Sherburne County and Waste Management, which is the company that owns the landfill. And we put together a plant out there, a generating plant, to capture the methane gas. And we make it into electricity. That's where we generate about 15% of Elk River's needs on landfill gas, a resource that would otherwise be wasted. But what we're standing in now, of course, is the Elk River Public Library and this is a Gold LEED certified building. One of very, very few libraries in the country that are Gold LEED certified. LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. 
and that means a building that is built to conserve energy, to conserve water, use recycled materials in the construction. The building is heated and cooled with a geothermal heating system. This is the second building that now that I have that has geothermal. It should be a lot less maintenance as far as this equipment goes. In the old days, you know, um, for instance, I have one building that still has boilers in it. That has to be inspected every day. You can't go with more than two days without having that inspected and checked, you know. It's just one of those time-consuming things. And this is a little safer. There's, you don't have any gas. We're not burning any gas in the building at all. So there's a safety factor involved there also. There's a lot of, lot of advantages to this kind of thing. Um, once, you, once you control the times it has to be on, then you'll start saving your electricity bills too. Project Conserve, uh, we have uh, established some targets. We'd like to have the average household use 20% less electricity, 25% less water, increase their recycling, and reduce the waste stream by, I believe it's 25%. We think that the average household would save about $400 a year, and when you put transportation fuel into that uh, formula, probably around $1,500 a year by participating in Project Conserve. You can imagine if the whole nation decided that they could reduce electricity by 25%, and every community was promoting that, and they reached that goal, that would be a huge savings. I'm not really a tree hugger, but there are people who call me that. Um, but out of practicality, yeah, we've, like I say, we've got to start being serious about energy conservation. Uh, we're going to run out. Uh, supposedly, we've got about 40 years of natural gas reserves left. Um, and uh, we're not doing very good things to our atmosphere by putting a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. When uh, China and India get on board and have lifestyles like ours or try to achieve our lifestyles. There's going to be shortages that we can't even imagine. A message to other communities would be get on board. Um, we've got to do something about our excessive energy use. We've got to start conserving our resources or there won't be any left for the youngsters coming up. One of the dilemmas is that it's not the same for every community. It really is something that has to stem from the local culture and local sense of values. People really want to take action and again they really want to see leadership from their cities because they don't want to act alone. There are so many ancillary benefits. When you get out and you um, bike and walk to reduce your transportation fuel for economic reasons, you're also really increasing the health benefits. Um, and we're, we're getting out there on, on our streets, on our bikes, walking, and, and there's a community benefit we know our neighbors more, we're seeing people, it reduces crime. Cities need to have strong economic development in order to thrive. Spending billions of dollars is not throwing it into a hole in the ground. Spending the billions of dollars is putting money into an economy. Uh, you can take that money and you can put it into one kind of investment or you can put it into another kind of investment. The climate change debate is not about spending money that we wouldn't be spending otherwise. It's about spending money in a different place than we would have otherwise. Both places will have an economic impact. They'll both create jobs. They'll create jobs in different places. Over these past couple of years, we've been working in a coalition with the Sierra Club and the Steelworkers. They have a blue-green alliance that brings governments together with unions and the environmental movement to create green jobs. In America today, we've stopped making things. The green economy gives us a chance to make them again. This beautiful historic building called City Hall is like most buildings, where the water runs off, goes into the storm sewer, and goes into our lakes and rivers. But nowhere nearly as much anymore, because now the green roof will capture some of that water, which will not only help these plants grow and cool the building, but keep uh, water from flowing uh, into the Mississippi. We undertook a lot of measures to reduce our combined sewer overflow. and in the last year we had zero. Well this is Sanford Middle School in South Minneapolis and what's behind me is the rainwater treatment pond. It's empty right now but this pond takes all of the water that drains off the top of the school, the rest of the school site and some of the water that comes from the street and the houses around here because the city pipes didn't have enough capacity to handle it. So when it runs in here it can settle out in the ponds. The phosphorus that we don't want in the river feeds the plants that you see. 
The particulates, another concern because it kills off fish, settle down and stay here. And the feel good is the kids used to have just flat asphalt here and the neighbors had just flat asphalt to look at. Kids can learn right here about their environment because there is a curriculum developed by one of the project engineers so they can be taught about the chemicals that are in a built-up city like this, what comes off the street, what comes off the roof, and how this pond actually works. This city is filled with people who have green values, and I think our role as the government is to inspire them and uh, even sometimes get out of the way. And collectively, those of us who are leading cities say that together we're going to make a green footprint. That'll create green jobs throughout this entire state. So we need big cities, small cities, counties, everyone in this state to really make sure that we're all making green purchasing decisions right, to create the businesses here, to continue to have us in leadership. And in that way, I think we'll create not only a better planet, but a more sustainable economy here in our own hometowns. Almost everybody's concerned about the environment, but a lot of people don't like environmentalists. And so the problem is that the message in many cases has been, I'm great, you're bad, you need to change. And of course the truth is, we're all bad and we all need to change. I believe the best way is to make sure that people understand that when you're talking about behavior modification, you're not talking about behavior modification. You're talking about achieving goals. It works best if people take ownership of these issues. So rather than telling people, here's how you should do it, letting them do it in their own terms. We are a very old German community, 154 years old. When the German immigrants got here, they wanted to be self-sufficient. So in addition to laying out the town site, what they came up with was their own electric power system. Then the gas came along and they absorbed that into the system. Uh, fresh water, wastewater, and so the entire utilities that we have are all city owned. We're not beholden to uh, any of the major power companies. We can go out in the open market buy power. Right now we are talking about uh, wind power. Uh, we're able to uh, control our destiny, if you will. As far as some of the conservation programs, uh, uh, some years back we uh, changed our street lights uh, from 150 watt incandescent bulbs to so 75 watt high pressure sodium to reduce our operating cost. In addition to that, we've got uh, the tree program that provides shade. Uh, we've got furnace cleaning and air conditioning cleaning program. We've got the normal rebate programs that involve uh, appliances. The Power Cost Monitor is a pilot program that the Energy Awareness Commission is also working on. We put it in 25 homes, um, regular family homes. We're monitoring their usage for six months, and then we're going to see if that monitor makes a difference. We got asked to be a part of a pilot program with uh, the city of New Ulm um, about in March of 2008. We hooked it up and we've been using that quite a bit. You can see the difference when the uh, washer and dryer runs at the same time and, and you don't uh, dry the clothes as long as you're used to it. You don't wait for it to buzz, you check them before that already. What have you learned about uh, your own energy uses since you've put it in there? Um, we've changed them. <laughs> It takes a thousand years for a plastic bag to get totally biodegradable. The Energy Awareness Commission ordered a thousand of these bags and we sold them to our customers for 50 cents a bag. The actual cost is about two dollars a bag, but we wanted to promote the reusable shopping bag. And they were very well received. We have sold um, about 930 of them. We probably have about 70 bags left. Every year we decorate our downtown area with Christmas lights. We decided to go to LED Christmas lights in 2006 for a number of reasons. By, by Christmas 2010, these lights will have paid for themselves with the energy saved. This place is the Putting Green Eco Center, and the Putting Green is all about saving the planet in a nutshell. And our mission statement is to educate and inspire people to make informed choices for a healthy planet. Our mini golf course was designed by kids. Each hole is a message about natural resources. There's signage. The public can come out golf. We've had over 5,000 kids come out here on field trips. They play mini golf. They go down to the Minnesota River and they can see the river and what's happening to the river. 
One of the favorite holes is the pig hole, manure management. Your balls and piece of corn goes in the pig's mouth. It's digested by the pig, comes out the other end as manure. Where does that manure go? It goes in the water or it goes into the farmer's field. Which is better? And the kids get it. Basically, it's just down to the triple bottom line of economic cost, environmental cost, and social cost. And a good, a good explanation of that out at the park that we do here would be our putt-putt soda. And we use corn cups and they can be composted. And for economic cost for our putt-putt soda would be that we get the putt-putt soda for free from shells and they're locally just down the road. You have to have the community buy-in for the very simple things, then you can tackle the bigger things. When you're looking for energy conservation, you're not going to find one big ticket item. It's all of the little things that you do. And whenever you purchase an appliance, whenever you're using electricity, just think about how you can use it more efficiently. Taking action is the key. And uh, our experience is that it's uh, much easier to express concern than to change your behavior. So that, we'll see if we really can change our behavior. Am I optimistic? Absolutely. I believe that we have all kinds of resources. I think that since the 70s, we've been really thinking about the innovation that's necessary. I think we're ready to jump. And it's time for us as leaders to be able to, to inspire one another and open the box and let it out. Green Cities Leading the Way is a co-production of the League of Minnesota Cities on the web at lmc.org and TPT's Minnesota channel.